There is nothing worse than untapped potential. If you know that you're made for more, this is the place. I know that every successful person I've ever met has one thing in common. They do not let themselves fall victim to their circumstances. They figure out a way to rise above it. So join me on this journey where I help you to be better, do better, and have better in life and in business. If you're feeling stuck and you're needing some practical tools, some hope to get you to that better life, this is definitely the place for you. Hey everyone, welcome to the Unstuck Podcast. I am Lachelle Weeby, and today I get a chance to interview Dr. Kevin Payne. You guys, he is someone that is so inspirational, the things that he has been through himself, as well as the way that he tries to bless and help other people. Kevin, it is such an honor to have you here today, and I am so excited to hear all about the things that you have in store for our audience, everything from the book that you wrote to to the programs that you have, all the things that you're doing, I know are making a difference. So I would love to, to turn the floor over to you. Why don't you tell us a little bit about who you are and how you're trying to serve people today? Well, thank you so much, Lachelle, and, and thank you for welcoming me to the Unstuck podcast. There are probably three things people would want to know about me right off the bat. One, yeah. my doctorate's in sociology and psychology. So I study people. I've studied people for 30 years. I spent 15 years as a professor. I spent a decade as a startup entrepreneur building technical tools that help support better lives. And right now I am, as you mentioned, an author and founder of Your Life Lived Well. And that brings me to the second thing people probably want to know about me. And that is that I've lived with multiple sclerosis since 1989. And like many people, I was undiagnosed or misdiagnosed for many years. And the symptoms that led to my eventual diagnosis, because as many are aware, multiple sclerosis is a moving target. Mm -hmm. It's changing all the time. It's, it's the gift that keeps on giving. Yeah. And so the symptoms that led to my correct diagnosis began in 2002. So I've lived with it for a long time. I've lived with chronic illness. I spent a decade as a caregiver to a wife with an advanced cancer. So I've, I've lived the chronic illness life mm -hmm. from the caregiver side as well. Yeah. And, and that's what prompted me to build your life, live well, and to do all these things. And the third thing that people are probably be interested in is that I am an enthusiastic skydiver. So I fling myself... <laughs> To the earth at terminal velocity with glee and abandon on every occasion I can find. And I live really close to my drop zone, so it's easy for me to duck out uh, on a good weather day and, and zip over there for a jump or two and then get back to work. Oh, my gosh. Okay, you probably lost count. How many times have you jumped out of a plane? Oh, no, you, you need to keep track. It's, <laughs> it's 600 That's amazing. Uh, because we log them. Just like pilots, we log every jump yeah. and what happened yeah. and all that stuff. So I, there's so. so many things that I cannot wait to talk to you about, but I'm just going to ask you this. When you jump out of the plane on your 600th time, do you still get mm. that little nervous feeling in your stomach or is it that's all abandoned you by now? All of the, the little bit of fear that it, you might have. This, this is a, That's a really interesting topic mm -hmm. because... What we think of as fear yep. isn't fear, and and you know this, and and there is a physiological response, which is our acute stress response, yep. and it's physiological arousal, and so I do get some of that, yep. right? Even even doing it hundreds of times because my body is gearing itself up for a challenge, mm -hmm. but it's not fear because it's something that I've learned to reframe. Yep. And to become very comfortable in, because the sky is my happy place now. Yeah. I, after, after you do something mm -hmm. hundreds of times, yeah. then humans are marvelously adaptive. We can even adapt to something that we've got no business doing, like skydiving. I love that. And, and so I kind of deliberately asked that question because I think that there are people who are listening, who are stuck and they're stuck by things like fear. They're stuck by things that 
that literally paralyze them from taking action. And one of the things that I try to bring home on a regular basis is that people still, even they, though they do it hundreds of times, still get that physiological feeling of what right. you would say in air quotes, fear, right? But just like you said, our body, um, and I have my doctorate degree in anesthesia, so I you know, understand the body. And I know that the same physiological response that we get from fear is also from excitement, right? Exactly. It's the exact same, you know, my heart races, the, you know, my gut feels funny. Um, all, all of the things that I experience in my body with fear, I experience with excitement. So when we can reframe it, we don't mm -hmm. have to be, I guess, in fear of it or, or, not wanting it in our life, we can accept that it's excitement and go for it. And I, I would love for, for you to expand upon that. Yeah. When that, that physiological arousal or that yes. excitement that we feel, we, we have to understand where that fits in evolutionarily, mm -hmm. right? And, and how this came about. And, and it worked really well for our distant ancestors who were facing maybe a saber-toothed tiger in the umber underbrush, right? And and they have to focus right here, right now, make the world very small and very particular and ramp up our physiological responses for an acute challenge. Right. And And those were the challenges that our ancestors lived with for thousands of years. Mm -hmm. But humans have created a world that is a very different environment to the ones that our ancestors lived in. And so every time we face something mm -hmm. that we think is going to be a challenge mm -hmm. that may have a negative outcome or at the very least we are unsure right. about what's going to happen. Right. Because we tend to fill in the blanks, yeah, the we call automatic it's vigilance, worse, yeah. right? <laughs> yeah. And and we and we and we fill in the the blanks with the you know this awful thing. That's when that response comes in, and it's our primal brain mm -hmm. doing the only thing it can to try to protect us and to try to keep us safe. Mm -hmm. And and what we have to understand about our primal brain is that not only does it only have a limited set of tools mm -hmm. it has a limited perspective right it was adapted in a world where there were only certain things to see only certain signals to process mm -hmm. and so now that we've created a world with all of these layers on top of right. these social and right. cultural layers mm -hmm. it still can't understand those our forebrain has to jump in and and if the primal brain has short-circuited us, mm -hmm. then we have what I call our cave child driving. Right. And how do you get the cave child from not driving? How do you get the frontal lobe to start to, to take over and process? Because I know that one of the things is that our brains and our primary brains, primal brains, just are trained to recognize patterns, right? So let's just say back in that day with rust, rustling leaves in the bush might indicate a predator, predator animal, let's just say. So we create mm -hmm. these patterns and then we perceive them and we add meaning to them. Just because we add mm -hmm. meaning to them does not make it true. Now, I could, it could have been right. a child playing in the bushes. So this, because mm -hmm. we created this pattern, doesn't mean that that pattern is truth. It's just the way that we put that pattern together. And so... There's, there's ways that our body can sabotage us. And I would love to hear from you, how do we get the front part of our brain to kick in and override that primal brain? I'll give you two things to start with. And the first is that we have to practice the pause. Okay. So the, the very first stage in this so-called fight or flight mm -hmm. response yeah. is actually freeze. And it's not fight or flight. There's actually like eight or nine of these mm -hmm. Fs that they go. So it's freeze, front, flight, fight, fawn, fright, faint. I mean, it you know it goes on and mm -hmm. on. And there are a couple more in there. But my point here is that that first freeze mm -hmm. is what's called hypervigilance. Okay. And and our we we heighten our senses 
And we have to learn to extend that because this is the place where we can insert our conscious mind to say, oh, here's what's really happening. Mm. And, and so if you extend that pause mm -hmm. and it takes practice to do it mm -hmm. because you probably have your go-to thing that you do when you're afraid. Right. And uh, you don't even think about it. You're already, the, by the time you realize you're doing it, you're already into it. So, so that's the first thing. Practice the pause. The second thing is your inner cave child is doing the best it possibly can to protect you. Right. And what that means is if you respond to that by diminishing it and by, uh, you know, putting it down mm -hmm. and, and by, uh, you know, castigating it, mm -hmm. right? Right. You know, then what are you doing? You're, you're causing this awful fight within yourself. Right. So, so you have to acknowledge mm -hmm. and you have to say, thank you. And realize that this is your cave child. Yeah. And you have to say, thank you for doing what you're doing. Yeah. I understand. I hear your signal. Now watch this. I'm going to go ahead and do that thing yeah. and we're going to succeed. And you're going to learn that we can do that and we can be okay on the other side. Mm. Because we learn from the results of the behavior. And so if you short circuit yourself before you ever get a chance to get to the behavior, mm -hmm. you will never have that learning. All you're doing is reinforcing your child's message mm -hmm. that we need to pull back. Yeah. That's, that's really powerful. And I think that one of the things that I, that I, that's come into mind in this is that people will make their ego or their comfort zone or their cave child interchangeably. Mm -hmm. We can talk about all of them as one as the enemy, mm -hmm. right? Just like you said. Right. And so it's like, Oh, you know, I'm stronger than this or, Oh, this is stupid or whatever. Instead embracing that and, and thanking them is so mm -hmm. powerful because it takes away that negativity. And instead you're like, Hey, watch this. I'm an adult now that knows that this is going to be okay. So let's go, let's do this together. And by you getting into action, you're essentially training your cave child that it's okay. And the more times you do it, the more you're able to teach that cave child. Just like I have children myself and I have to show them right. over and over again that it, this is okay. And eventually it just becomes that new identity. Right. And people think that we are a unified identity. Mm -hmm. And we are not. Identity is the story we tell ourselves about ourselves yeah. as we are trying to make sense of the world and of what I call the society of mind. So we have many, many different, uh, you know, it's not just the cave child, mm -hmm. but, but there are uh, various identities that, that we develop over the years. And some of them, we're internalizing them from our culture, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. uh, and, and, all of those voices are trying to get a say in what you're going to do, but you're only you. So you can only do the one thing and not all of them are going to be happy about that. Right. And, and you have to understand that that's okay. And I think what one, what people don't recognize is that you do something that you think is air quotes, stupid, mm -hmm. right? And you get down on yourself about it. And, and you, you really, you know, you really get onto yourself about this awful thing that you did. Yeah. But here's a different way to think about it. What if you accepted that even for the stupidest thing you've ever done, yeah. at that time, there was one of your voices in this Greek chorus in your head yeah. who absolutely was convinced that was a good thing to do. Mm -hmm. Wow. Now, if you think about it, people almost never are trying to do harm. Right. You're almost never trying to do harm to yourself. What happens is 
not all of our voices can see the big picture. Right. So how much better would we be if if we were nicer to ourselves? If we were not just nicer, if we were kinder to ourselves. Yes, a hundred percent. And you know, one of the things that I've noticed with the people that I've helped and the people that that come to me for leadership is that they don't believe that they're capable of something better or capable of doing the scary things. And it comes back to that identity and, and finding your own self-worth, your own belief in yourself that you're capable of it. Because oftentimes too, I find that the, the lack of belief in them being possible or it being possible for them is what holds them back from even starting in the beginning. Yeah. Is that something that you found as well? Oh, most definitely. We are almost always our own biggest obstacle. Mm-hmm. And and we're almost always our own biggest obstacle for the what we feel are the best reasons. We think that we're trying to protect ourselves. And and mm-hmm. we forget that. And I call this, you know, in the book, and I, I call this the edge. And the edge okay. is a ratio. And and it's it's a ratio between what a, a circumstance is demanding of you and the capacity you can deliver right now. So if the demand is really low and our capacity is really high, then we're bored. Right. If the demand is a little higher, then uh, now we're in the range of habit, right? Mm-hmm. And it's easy for us to do. We don't even think about right. it. If the demand is getting closer to the capacity we can give, then now, as long as the capacity is just a little bit more, we're on the edge. And that's a flow experience. Yes, yes. And, we, and flow experiences are some of the greatest human experiences we ever have because we feel challenged, but mm-hmm. we feel in the zone mm-hmm. and we feel like we are accomplished something. We feel yeah. our own agency and it's wonderful. Yeah. But then when that demand gets a little higher, yeah. then we're overwhelmed and we fail. And when it gets a lot higher than what we can deliver, that's trauma. And so my point is, if you pull back from the potential failure at the edge, Mm -hmm. you will also pull yourself back from all the good, wonderful, growth-inducing, beautiful human experiences we crave. Right, right, 100%. I got to just ask you because I think this is important in, in the conversation, in the story. So you personally have suffered from a chronic illness. You mm-hmm. personally had the privilege, but the taxing role, I guess, of being a ter- caregiver to your wife. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And so you had all kinds of excuses to stay stuck. You had all kinds of excuses to just to, to stay where you were, what gives you the drive? What gave you the drive to, to move forward and continue to work on being the best version of yourself? Well, first, and, and I want to emphasize, I got stuck. I got stuck. I got so stuck that I, I could no longer see a path from the life I had to a, any life I was interested in living. And, and it really was that dark. Mm. And I, I was dealing with, a, uh, you know, exacerbations to my MS that were not just physical; they were cognitive. Mm-hmm. And I couldn't get my brain to do what my brain had always done. Yeah. And, you know, I, I found myself alone. My career had blown up. My personal life had blown up. Everything was pretty awful. My dog even died on me, traumatically yeah. in front of me. Oh. It was. It was awful. Yeah. And so I was, I was stuck. I was about as stuck as you could possibly get. And at that point, it wasn't because I didn't want to move forward. It was because I couldn't see a way forward. I'd gotten in my own way. I couldn't see a path Mm -hmm. that would take me where I wanted to go because yeah. I knew I, you know, I, I had a vision in my life where I wanted to go, Yeah, but I couldn't see how to get there. Yeah. Yeah. So one day my, my son who was about, oh, he's about 14 or so mm-hmm. said, dad, you really suck at doing things for yourself. And 
on the one hand, that's kind of a funny teenager thing to say. Yeah. But on the other hand, it was kind of soul crushing. Yeah. Because no father wants to hear that from their son. And I knew he was right. I knew that in the years of just trying to put one foot in front of the other with my MS, as it had gotten worse in the years of supporting his mother through cancer and that aftermath, in the years of you know being a one income for a family of four yeah. as we were struggling through all yeah. this, I had stopped taking care of myself. Mm. And by the time he said that, it had probably been a decade since I had done anything just for myself. And so I thought about it mm -hmm. for a, a while. Yeah. And, and I thought, I need a win. I have had so many losses. Yeah. I've lost everything that I really care about. So for me, mm -hmm. the choice was obvious. It was logical. I, I wanted to go back and reclaim skydiving because I knew that was going to be a real challenge for me yeah. because I got trouble with my legs doing what mm -hmm. they're supposed to be doing. Yeah. And, you know, you know, they always say with MS, the very first thing is avoid stress. So I'm going to put myself in a <laughs> circumstance where I'm tripping my acute stress response repeatedly. Yeah. And, but it was a childhood dream that I wanted. And I also knew the thing I had become most afraid of in the world, I had become afraid of my own body. Mm. because my own body had betrayed me on so many occasions. So I was going to put myself in a position where I would succeed. I would literally save myself or I would die. And I would be able to do that time after time. Because the kind of confidence you get when you're headed to the earth at 120 miles an hour and you make a positive decision to save yourself mm. and then you do it and you land on target, that is an overwhelming confidence that you can carry into the rest of your life. Oh my goodness. I need to hear more about that. I need to hear more about that exact experience and other things that you did to then take the next steps to get you from where you were to where you are now. You guys, I am going mm -hmm. to just take a moment and I want to tell you all about something that I'm super passionate about that I literally cannot wait to tell you about. So as soon as we're finished with that, I'm going to bring in back to back Dr. Dr. Kevin Payne. And we're going to go into more details all about the ways that he went from where he was to where he is now. Hey, Lichelle here. And I just got to ask you, do you ever listen to podcasts or special training from gurus who are telling you exactly what to do? but you still have questions, wouldn't it be amazing if you actually could ask questions to the people who are presenting to give you your personalized answer to how you can get into action and apply it to your unique situation. That is exactly why I created the Better Club Elite, which is a very special, very exclusive monthly membership that gives you access to those question and answer sessions that are going to get you in action and get you all lined up with everything that you need to start being better, doing better, and having better in life and in business. The support, the answers, and everything that you need to get you into action. So let's go. All right. So you guys, I have been waiting for the rest of the story, and I know you guys have too. So, so you decided that you needed to start making a change, and you knew that you had a better in your life that you wanted, but you didn't know how to get there. And so you decided that skydiving was going to be that first step. So tell me about what that did for you and the other things that you were able to do then after that because of it. Yeah. So for me, it was something that I'd wanted to do since I was a little kid. Yeah. Something that I'd started to do in the 90s. Okay. When I was working on my doctorate and I got, you know, a handful of jumps in and did the first training and then a lot of life got in the way and then my MS got worse and I thought I'm never going to get back to this. Mm -hmm. So I had just enough experience with it to know that on the other side of fear. So like when you are in the door of an airplane mm -hmm. getting ready to exit, 
That's where fear lives. Okay. On the other side of that door, after you are out, yeah. there's no fear. It's joy. You are so mindful. You are so focused. Mm -hmm. You are so in that moment. There is nothing else but you and the sky. And it feels like you're flying. It doesn't feel like you're falling. It feels like you're floating. And, and it is an amazing feeling of accomplishment and connectedness. Mm. So every time I go out a door, we usually go out at 14,000 feet. Okay. A little voice in the back of my head says 82 seconds. 82 seconds. Because when I leave that door, my life expectancy is now 82 seconds unless I do something very right and save myself. That is a pretty sobering realization yeah, yeah. when you think about yeah. it. But, but it's, and that's why, you know, on the cover of my book, mm -hmm. you've seen the photo here yeah. and it's me mm -hmm. and, and it's got, you know, beautiful. So it took us, you know, six weeks to get this exact photo that I wanted. But what I'm doing on the cover of this book, it's telling the story of the book and it's telling the story that I'm here. So I'm at 5,000 feet headed to the earth at 120 miles an hour when that photo is taken. That means I have 27 seconds left to live at that point. And I'm, I've got my hands up to my forehead, and I'm about to sweep them out very wide. Yeah. And that's called the wave off. Every skydiver would recognize this. Because this is the point in the skydive where I have decided I am taking positive action to save myself. Mm. So I wave off, and I deploy my parachute. And... How often in our lives do we get, day in and day out, the opportunity to actively, positively, literally mm. save ourselves? That is an amazingly empowering thing. Yeah, yeah. So after I got my license in 2019, and I logged about 140 jumps or so that year and got my first two licenses. So I wanted to get, my next goal was to become a legit skydiver. Mm -hmm. So that means you got to get over 500 jumps to okay. get all the licenses. I, I earned a coach rating so I can help teach people. Cool. And the, that meant that my goal for 2020 was to average better than one jump a day for the entire year. So I logged 370 jumps in 2020. Wow. And that's like a respectable number of skydives, yeah. you know, even in skydiving world. Yeah. And, and so every single day, despite my MS, despite people saying, no, avoid stress, mm -hmm. it was, I am going to have this experience where I confront my wonky central nervous system mm -hmm. in the air and demonstrate to myself that I can save myself. And I'm going to do that every single day. And so that was my journey for 2020. Wow. And, and that gave me, you know, I may be a little dense. Uh, most people maybe not, you know, they might not need that much. But, but I needed to yeah. really confront that fear right. every day. Right. You had to prove to yourself that you were that you had what it takes. And I think that right, right. it's so, like for real, Kevin, this is so profound because we have the opportunity to save ourselves every single day. Now there's a couple of analogies, I guess, that I'm going to take from your story and kind of apply it to our normal life. Number one, mm -hmm. if we don't take the risk, if we don't stand at the edge of the door and jump, we miss out on the amazing experience that is in store for us. If you never jumped out that door, you would never get the experience of flying. You would never get that experience of that bliss that you have when you're in the air. On the other side of that door, you guys, is something that is beyond what you could ever imagine for yourself. You just have to jump. You just have to open the door and go. And if you don't, you're missing out 
on something that could literally change your life. The second thing that I think is important in your story is that you're not doing it recklessly, which means that you're not going to jump out of a freaking airplane without a parachute. You're going to take the precautions that you need. You need to learn the steps. You have the right equipment. You did all the things that you need to do to minimize or mitigate the risk. So if you are facing something that you have a lot of fear around, what can you do to mitigate the risk? What can you do to set yourself up for the highest likelihood that it's going to go well? Does it mean that you have to learn something new? Does it mean that you have to practice? Does it mean that you have to, I don't know, there's all kinds of things that we can do, but what can we do to prepare ourselves? And then the thing that is literally giving me goosebumps is that you are choosing to save your own life. And we can do that in, yeah. in things like picking up the sales call that we've been avoiding. It could be to hit and roll with the business that we've been thinking about. It could be to pick up the phone and ask, asking the, the woman out. It could be so many things. I think about back when I was, you know, worried about whether or not I could be a, a good mom. And I remember comparing it to standing on the edge of a cold pool. And it's like, I knew that I wanted to jump, but I was too afraid to jump. But I knew that once I jumped, I was going to be in the pool and I would never want to get back out. And and that's exactly what happened. And I think about that. If I would have let my fears hold me back of that cold pool that I felt like I was jumping into, I would never experience the love of being a parent. And those of you guys that have had that have kids, you understand. If I would have let my fear yeah. hold me back, I would have missed out on all of that amazing stuff. And so I just, I thank you so much for for not only the literal example that you've given us, Kevin, but the, the metaphorical mm -hmm. profound. Well, that's yeah. The profound yeah. courage. Yeah. I, I, I think, I think the, you know, there are a couple of important things here to follow on from what you were saying. One is that edges are everywhere. So I picked a big obvious edge. Almost everybody would think jumping out of an airplane is an edge, Yeah, but what I want to emphasize is that my life, your life, everybody's life is full of edges all the time. Yeah. And edges are not just physical, they're cognitive, they're emotional, they're social, they're behavioral, they're, they're everywhere. Mm -hmm. And some of them are really small. Some of them are so small, they're, they're humiliating. Like, you know, some mornings my hands don't work very well. And so it's difficult just to get the meds that I need to take in the morning mm -hmm. for my MS into my mouth. Mm -hmm. And, and that's really frustrating mm -hmm. and, and you know, it's humbling, right? But the thing, one of the things that you emphasized was that, you know, skydiving, it's not just, it's not just risk taking, you know, skydiving is a dangerous activity that can be done safely. And the point of doing a skydive mm -hmm. is to be able to do another skydive. Right. Okay. Right. So you, you want to be able to survive at the edge. And the reason why this frames the book is because when you pick that book up, you may feel like you are, your life is in free fall. You may feel like you are at the mercy of forces far beyond your control. Mm -hmm. And, and what I'm saying in the book is, not that there's one particular way to save yourself, but there's a set of knowledge and information that you can be given that can allow you to make better decisions about how you're going to save yourself. Yeah. And that's the important thing. So, you know, for me, yeah, skydiving was an edge, but it was the edge I needed to get the the confidence in myself right. to go ahead and finish the book and go ahead yeah. and get the company launched and work on the technology and all of those yeah. other things because those were all big things yeah it was and a catalyst i didn't feel like i was up to it right yeah it was the spark and so I would needed. you recommend then this is just an interesting interesting perspective when somebody can recognize that they're holding themselves back from saving themselves would you recommend mm -hmm. that they do what you did and pick the scariest thing 
do it, survive it, and then give yourself the confidence to do all the other things? Or do you recommend starting with something small and proving to yourself that you can do it? I'm just curious because there's a couple of different schools of thought on that. Well, there, it, I, I, I'm going to, I'm going to, uh, give the wishy-washy science answer. Yeah. It depends. <laughs> and it, it depends on your disposition. It depends on your circumstances, that sort of thing. Um, for Here's what's important. Okay. It's not the size mm-hmm. of the edge that you face. Okay. It is that you do it. That you do mm-hmm. it. And then that you keep doing it because we don't an edge you're gonna have to understand an edge then once you faced it a few times Mm. then you grow Mm. and you push your edge out yeah a little further yeah right and and that's physically we do that through exercise Mm -hmm. we do that uh cognitively by by learning in school Mm. and as lifelong learners we do that socially in our relationships, by becoming more intimate and more connected with one another, mm-hmm. it's the same process. Living systems grow when they're tested. Right. When you test them too much at once, that's how we get trauma. Yes, yes. Okay? So, so you've got to find an appropriate edge that you can keep revisiting because we can't live in that edge mode all the time. We've got to circle back around to what I call home, right? So you visit the edge, you've, you've spurred yourself for learning and growth and everything, Mm -hmm. but where that happens is back home where you can rest and relax and recover and recuperate and sleep and nourish yourself and consolidate and all those things. Yes. And then you go back out again. Right. So it's a cycle. That is so, so fascinating because I think that you've given me this, this picture of you, you're jumping out of a plane and then you're going back home and you're resting and you're getting yourself prepared for the next time. But the next time now your capabilities are just a little bit better than they were the last time. And I think that when exactly. we live in this state of constant stress, constant, um, pushing constant, whatever, and we're not giving ourselves mm-hmm. that chance to go back and, and, in, like you said, home and refresh and revitalize ourselves to be able to come back a little bit better than what we were the last time. We're going to burn ourselves out. It's going to be an overwhelm. It's not going to be fun. There's no going to be no joy in that. And it just doesn't lead to to anything good. No, no. And in fact, that's that's a good way to destroy yourself. Mm -hmm. So what what I think is probably the most important thing for people to cultivate Yeah is the practice of being regular at confronting your edge. Mm. So I'll give you, for instance, yeah. like for me, I think that if you live with a chronic illness, it's easy to let that become an excuse for you being unhealthy. Instead, I think it is more crucial if you're living with a chronic illness mm. to do every other thing you possibly can to be as fit as you can mm-hmm. in every other way. Yeah. So for me, exercise is a non-negotiable thing. Mm-hmm. That that has to be done. And I have to work within the real physical limitations that that I deal with because my MS comes and goes mm-hmm. and and some days I can do a full weightlifting routine and I can row and I can do everything that I want to do yeah. and it's about a you know, 45 minute hour long workout. Yeah. And I feel really good about it. That's plan A. Plan B is, okay, this is my normal day where I'm, I'm my edge is a little bit further in, mm-hmm. right? And, and I'm still going to work out, but it's not going to be that intense. Mm-hmm. Why? Because doing a regular behavior yeah. is, the behavior is just the tip of the iceberg. It's doing identity work. It's building habit. It's it's doing emotional work. It's all, all this yeah. other stuff that's going on underneath the surface. Yep. So then, when I have really bad days, it's Plan C, and Plan C is the absolute minimum that I can do, even on my worst day. Yep. 
to preserve and respect the place I've made in my life for that behavior, that activity, that visiting of the edge. So it literally might be a day when I can barely walk Mm -hmm. and I'm going to take myself down to my weight room and I'm going to sit on my weight bench Mm -hmm. and it may be five pound weights. Yeah. And I do three exercises Mm -hmm. and, and that's it. And then I sit there and I mentally walk myself through the rest of the workout. Oh, very nice. Because I have done something to honor where that is in my life and to keep reinforcing that habit. Yep. Because we're always learning. No matter whether we think we're paying attention or not, yeah. we are always learning. And you're either learning that you're a person that keeps doing it, yeah. or you're learning a, that you are a person that allows yourself the excuse not to. Yep. And that's the identity word. And, yeah. And you are always going to fail. Mm-hmm. You have to understand that at the edge, sometimes you succeed, sometimes you fail. And that's okay. Right. That's part of it. Right. Don't beat yourself up over it. Yeah. Do it again. Oh my gosh. Kevin, I could talk to you all day long. This has been a phenomenal conversation and I love just how inspiring you are, how real you are and how you give people hope from where they are to where they want to be. So I cannot wait to get my hands on your book. I am going to make sure that we have all of the ways that people can get a hold of you inside of the show notes, because I know that there's going to be other people like myself who, who want to dive more into all of the things that you're doing. Is there anything else that you haven't had a chance to mention that you really wanted to be able to say to our audience? Half of all Americans like me Mm -hmm. live with a chronic health condition. 18% of us have five or more diagnoses. It is mind boggling. Yeah. And, and the trends in the rest of the world are heading in our direction. Mm -hmm. So if you don't have a chronic health condition, you care about somebody who does. Yep. And the thing that I want to reinforce is that being sick now is a form of normal Mm -hmm. and and it's okay we are still people Mm -hmm. we still have hopes and joy and fears and dreams and we still have just this life to live yeah and we need to get the best out of it that we possibly can Mm -hmm. and so what that means is we need to each of us rethink what it means to be sick and what it means to live with a sickness and and to understand that yeah there are some there's some real limitations that come mm-hmm. with it that have yeah. to be negotiated yeah. yeah and and have to be accommodated yep but there's so much more that we can do as well yeah and and we can still interrogate our edges and yep. visit them and we need to be encouraged in that. 100%. All of us do. Yes, and in, and not making your identity be solely defined by your illness. Because like you said, there's so much more that we have to offer. Thank you so much. And I love being able to end our conversation with an opportunity for you to pose a question to our audience that you would encourage them to think about that is going to help them get from where they are to where they want to be. Sure. What have you done today Mm -hmm. to be kind to yourself. Love that. Love that. Thank you so much for everything. And I am so grateful for, for all of the wisdom that you have. And I just appreciate everything that you're doing in this world to inspire all of us. Well, thank you, Lachelle. And I appreciate what you're doing too. Thank you. So, All right, guys, we'll see you until next time. Thank you so much for listening to the Untuck Podcast. I'm so grateful to be on this journey with you. And don't forget to check out the show notes if you want to get into my private club, The Better Club, to be able to learn better ways to be better, do better, and have better. So until next time, keep showing up. Let's get unstuck together. Have a great day.